and welcome to this edition of Fireline. My name is Mark Vanacore. I'm the Public Information Officer with the Phoenix Fire Department, and we'd like to talk to you a little bit today about water safety and drowning prevention. We have had, in the City of Phoenix alone, 54 water-related incidents this year with 15 fatalities. It is our goal to get that down to zero. With a little bit of prevention and education, we really feel we can reach out to the public and get these incidents to stop and really keep the public safe from these incidents. When we talk about water safety and drowning prevention, the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of people is swimming pools. We're actually here at Cortez Park because we experienced a fatality in this very body of water. When we talk about water safety, we'd like to expand our conversation to include such things as buckets of water, toilet bowls, bathtubs, canals, swimming pools, and ponds and lakes as you see here. When we talk about water safety, it's important to remember the ABCs. A for adult supervision, B for barriers, and C for classes. When we talk about adult supervision, we want to make sure that when we have kids swimming in a swimming pool, we have one adult who's designated to be watching them. A great idea is to have one of these tags available, and have it around your neck, or any kind of a badge, and that would designate that one person is 100% responsible for watching those kids. When it's time for a break, you would hand this off to the next person, and that way we would always have somebody watching our kids. As far as adult supervision goes, we want to make sure that we also include the buckets, the toilet bowls, the bathtubs, and anything that can pose a danger to a child. A multi-layered approach is very effective when we talk about water safety. I'd like to send it over to Brian Scholl, who's going to talk about the B in our ABCs, which stands for barriers. The most effective barrier around a pool is a co-compliant pool fence. There are many regulations regarding pool fences that we want to talk about. The first is, what is the required height of a pool fence in the city of Phoenix? Five feet is the minimum height for a pool fence. This one is just shy of five feet, so this would be not code compliant. They would have to actually raise up this pool fence. The next thing we want to talk about is the width between the slats. That's this area right here. This is the area where a kid can actually squeeze himself through and get into your pool. Code says it can't be any greater than four inches. If for some reason it was greater than four inches, you are allowed to put chicken wire or some other type of barrier as long as they can't climb. So you couldn't use any kind of chain link fence for that. Finally, talking about the pool fence is what's the distance between the ground and the bottom of the fence? It can't be any greater than two inches. What we're worried about there is a kid actually being able to crawl underneath the pool fence and get into your pool. All pool fences should have a code compliant pool gate. Pool gates must be self-closing, self-latching, so that when you leave the pool area, it should close right behind you. If it doesn't, this is an easy avenue for a little kid to come right into your pool. In this case, this spring is probably bad and just needs to be replaced. Locking devices need to be 54 inches above ground so the kids can actually reach the lock and get themselves in the pool. This one is code compliant. Latches also have to be able to have some sort of padlock or other locking mechanism attached to it. You can put a lock on that and therefore once you're done with the pool, you guys can lock it up and their kids are safe. Pool gates are required to swing away from the pool. Unfortunately, for this pool gate, it swings towards the pool. So if this doesn't latch correctly, all a kid has to do is put a little bit of pressure on it and get right in. Common things that people do a lot to pool gates is they like to put rocks or something in front of the pool gate so they don't have to re um, reopen it. We see this a lot in apartment complexes where we actually have to use a key to get back into the pool. All this does is allow a kid, once you turn your back, to be able to get into the pool and potentially drown. So never put anything in front of the pool gate. Another big issue that we run into is people putting chairs or something else that kids can climb onto and get into the pool fence. Don't have anything where a kid can climb on near the pool fence. Adult supervision and a proper pool barrier are a great start in hoping to reduce the number of drownings in the city of Phoenix. If you have any questions about pool barriers, please feel free to call Fire Prevention at 602-262-6771. The C in our acronym for ABC stands for classes. I'd like to introduce Kelly Lieberman and Becky Hewlett, who are going to talk about taking swim lessons and CPR classes. We 
know that there's adult supervision, there's barriers, and then there's classes. And the C for classes would be swim lessons. So I see we have multiple kids out here today learning swim lessons. What is the importance in that in preventing drowning? It's really important that kids learn how to swim. Um, if kids don't learn how to swim by the age of nine or third grade, research says most likely they will never learn how to swim. And that really leads into those older kids drowning and adult drownings and adults not teaching their kids how to swim. Learning how to swim is a layer of protection. It is not fail safe, but it is a layer of protection that will help um, parents teach their kids how to be safe around the water. So you not only have swim lessons for children, but you also have them for adults as well? We absolutely do. We teach kids from six months old all the way through adult years. So it's important that you do learn how to swim at a young age to help with curb those childhood drownings, but also that you learn as an adult, especially so you can teach your kids how to swim and be safe around the water. What makes the City of Phoenix Aquatics so special and so unique in the ability to provide swim lessons? Like, is it the cost? Is it the quality? The City of Phoenix offers uh, affordable swimming lessons for everybody. It's two weeks of swimming lessons. You have eight classes, 35 minutes each for $15. It's um, definitely a quality program. We teach kids how to swim in those two weeks. It's important to us that kids learn how to be safe in the water. And so we really push those young ones on how to, if they fall in the water, what they need to do to get out of the water. It's not going to drown proof them but it is going to give us a few extra precious seconds to help save their lives if they do fall in. Drowning is silent, it's quick. Um, a lot of times there is not a surface struggle, especially those little ones that, are, that have the big heads, little bodies is what we call them. They go face down and it looks like they may be swimming, it looks like they may be playing, but they're not. And um, it's very difficult to, to see that. Once they submerge under the water, it's difficult to see with the refra refraction of the sun, the water, the movement. So it, drowning is, is silent and it can happen to anyone. And, and that's what I've heard is that people seem to think that, oh, I'll hear them screaming, I'll hear them yelling for help. But really, I mean, as a paramedic, I know that when people are in a situation where they can't breathe, they're not screaming because that takes oxygen. They're actually trying to just inhale and get that extra breath. But I guess noticing some of the signs and symptoms of a distressed swimmer or a drowner would be something. I'm sure that you teach all of your lifeguards that here as well. We absolutely do. And part of it is, you know, they're going to be very low in the water. They're not going to be screaming. They're going to be trying to just keep their nose and their mouth above water. You know, when I was, when I was young, I learned how to bob in my swimming lessons. Well, that's also a sign of a, dis of a distressed swimmer. Somebody who doesn't know how to swim may be in water over their head and they may be able to touch the bottom of the pool, bounce off and come to the, air for, for, come to the surface for air. Um, many times those kids get exhausted and they end up in deeper water. Another one that I'm familiar with is that I've heard the ladder climb, where they're actually trying to climb, it's like they're trying to climb a ladder in the water, trying anything they can do to just pop their lips out for a breath of air. I mean, is that something that happens as well? It does, it does. It looks like they're cl climbing that invisible ladder. So you don't, it do, it's not a big um, movement, so to speak. It's, it's a much smaller movement, but they're trying to grasp water, trying to grasp something to pull them up out of the water. These are things that we need to recognize and that they're not going to be screaming and, and yelling for help, but truly remaining focused on on watching those children. But I love the fact that these swim lessons, the cost is great, you know, and again, I have my own 15-month-old daughter out here getting swim lessons at this exact pool. It's a great group of people. It's fun. It's nice to be able to sit back and chat with the parents, and we're watching for only 30 minutes, but a 30-minute class, the kids are having a great time, and I love it. So thank you and helping to prevent drowning. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. In any CPR situation, the first step in the chain of survival is to recognize there's an emergency. Initially, you want to check responsiveness. This patient is non-responsive. We're also looking to see if there's rise and fall in the chest or if they're breathing of any sort. This point, no responsiveness, not breathing, call 911 or delegate someone to do it. Also, have them bring an AED. If one is available, these, an automated external defibrillator, will essentially restart the heart. It will shock it. 
Moving into CPR, the acronym is CAB, Compressions, Airway, Breathing. Compressions is what we start with, to start the circulation. It is essential we put our palm of our hand, center of the chest, mid-nipple line. Proper hand placement, as you can see, center of the chest. We are attempting to get two inches of depth, at least on an adult patient. Fast and hard, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. You recognize that my elbows are locked, my knees are as close to the, to the patient as possible, and I'm using the upper body weight of myself to help get that depth. Once I've completed 30 compressions, I move on to the A in cab, which is airway. Pinching the nose, head tilt, chin lift. We want to open up that airway and pull the tongue off the, off the back of the throat. Mouth to mouth seal. You have to inflate these lungs. Picture yourself blowing up a balloon. You have to have a complete seal around the mouth in order to get lungs, the lungs to rise and fall with your breath. When I'm giving the two breaths, I'm looking to see if there is adequate rise and fall. If not, readjust the head, readjust the mouth, and try again. After you've completed compressions, open the airway and given two breaths, we continue to 30 more compressions. And we complete this cycle five times, reassess the patient, and keep going. You may be fatigued. If you can keep going, I recommend keep going. Do everything you can for that patient or until help arrives. With that being said, I want to make sure that everyone understands that People aren't just going to wake up after you do CPR. Again, the goal is to help keep the brain alive until advanced life support gets there and we can get this victim to a hospital. A child age ranges between one and eight years old. And the only significant difference is that we're using one-handed CPR instead of two. We don't want to have the depth and the weight over that smaller body. What we're doing, we can start with the same placement, mid-nipple line, center of the chest, putting the palm of your hand center. And also, you can do the head tilt method right here to help the air go in and out of the lungs. We're going to do the same amount of compressions to breath, 30 to two, one. After 30 compressions, you give two breaths, pinch the nose, one, Two, looking for rise and fall, 30 compressions again. If you find it difficult to just use one hand compressions, you can also grab your elbow lock and do this. But again, it's compressions, airway, breathing. An infant is from birth to one years old. And with any CPR we're providing, it is essential they are on a hard, flat surface. With an infant, we're actually able to bring them up to a table, which makes CPR easier, and I'll show you why. We will do the same acronym, CAB, Compressions Airway Breathing. And what makes an infant different is that we're only going to be using two fingers. We locate mid-nipple line, center of the chest, raise the pointer finger, and we're using the middle finger and the ring finger to provide an inch and a half depth of compression at a hard, fast pace. We're doing 30 compressions. Once we do 30 compressions, we move on to A, which is airway. For an infant's airway, we want to have them in the sniffing position. Sniffing position being here, not all the way back, not too far forward sniffing position to make an inline airway. Once we have their head in a sniffing position, go ahead and make a complete seal around the nose and the mouth in order to get two adequate breaths. And adequate breaths mean to be small, small puffs of air. Their lungs are very small. Once you give your two breaths, we resume compressions again. 
And because it's with an infant, we can leave our hands in place, keeping our hand on the, to keep the airway in line and also on compressions, making it extremely fast. And you continue doing CPR until the patient is revived or help is there. In this segment, we're going to be discussing continuous compression resuscitation, or hands-only CPR. This is for adults and teens only in a witnessed cardiac arrest event. Not child drownings, not infant drownings, just adults and teens in witnessed cardiac arrest events. You could be at a hotel, you could be at a pool somewhere, in a baseball game, church, any location, but it has to be witnessed cardiac arrest. We need to keep circulating that oxygenated blood through the brain because it starts to die after about four to six minutes. And when a person has a cardiac arrest, they have about four to six minutes of pre-oxygenated blood already running through their body that can be extremely useful in keeping that brain alive. Our initial step is the same thing as the regular CPR. We're going to initiate 911, get advanced life support on the way. At this point in time, we look at the patient and we see they're not breathing, they're not moving, they're not responding, start compressions. It's as simple as mid-nipple line, center of the chest, proper hand placement, two inches of depth, and just continue those compressions. And you stop when help has arrived, as in advanced life support, firefighters, paramedics, or another bystander can step in and relieve you. This can be a lot of work. But again, continual compressions. Most of what we told you here today, you've heard before. But unfortunately, we are still experiencing drowning fatalities. We can get this number down to zero. I've had the unfortunate experience of working these tragic incidents as a paramedic in the field. And also earlier this year, I've experienced this personally as some dear friends of ours lost their three-year-old in a drowning incident. These are all preventable. And with education and prevention, we can get this number down to zero. I'm Mark Vanacore, and thank you for joining us on Fireline.